Welcome to the Utah Leads webinar. I'm Pat Jones, the CEO of the Women's Leadership Institute, and I have been asked by the Chamber to moderate this panel today on higher education. I think you'll find it very fascinating. Uh, just a few housekeeping items. As you probably all know, you can use the chat function on the right to ask a question, and we will get to those a little bit later in the panel. Uh, a couple of things that I, and then I also need to let you know that we are recording this, obviously, and it will be available to you after the webinar. There's some new changes on the horizon for higher education. Uh, next week, the Utah Board of Regents and the Utah System of Technical Colleges will formally merge, and it will create a new higher education organization, which will be called the Utah Board of Higher Education. And during our discussion today, we, we will be talking about the impacts of that merger on various organizations, including business. Uh, so we want to make sure that you feel comfortable in, in asking the questions and, and feel free to go for it. I would like to, first of all, to introduce the panel uh, today. We have Harris Simmons, the chair of the Utah Board of Regents. Uh, Harris Simmons, would you give us maybe a, just a, a sentence or two about you? Many people know you, but let's let's hear it from you. Uh, sure, I've I've been on the uh, board of regents for uh, about eight years, uh, and have chaired the board for the last uh, last couple of years. Uh, my day job uh, is uh, I'm uh, the chairman and CEO of Zion's Band Corporation, which is the parent company of what everybody locally knows as Zion's Bank, but uh, uh, banking operations from Texas across the Western United States. Thank you, Harris. Uh, let's move to Aaron Osman. Aaron Osman is currently the vice chair of UTEC. Aaron, would you tell us a little bit about you? Unmute. Aaron, you're on mute there. Forgot to unmute myself. Okay, you'll learn. <laughs> I'll learn. Uh, it's good to be with you, Pat, and group. Um, Aaron Osmond, uh, my background is former uh, state senator uh, in Utah. I served uh, for, in the West Jordan, uh, South Jordan area for five years, and uh, I've been on the UTEC board for the last three years and served as the vice chair during that time. And professionally, I work for Amazon and their workforce readiness group globally and helping uh, prepare the workforce of the future. Thank you so much, Aaron. It's great to work with you again. Uh, next, we have Nina Barnes. Nina is the vice chair of the Utah State Board of Regents right now. Nina? Thanks, Pat. Uh, Nina Barnes, I've lived in Cedar City for the last 24 years and recently moved to St. George. Uh, my day job is running um, our, several real estate companies on the West Coast, uh, but I prefer to identify as a community activist an advocate and just have worked on lots of different boards, committees, uh, city council, trustee boards, and just really enjoy the work with education. So thanks. Thank you, Nina. And then uh, we next have Dave Wilson, who, uh, Dave Wilson, who is the interim commissioner of the Utah, of UCI, actually, Utah State Higher Education. Go thanks, Reed. Thanks, Regent Jones. And I can only say that for a few more days. And so I'm going to take the advantage of <laughs> using that Regent word to, to today as the new board forms. Obviously, the, the name Regents will, will go away. But I've been fortunate to be able to serve in this role as interim commissioner the last year, why a lot of this planning has is, is taken place. And before that, I spent many years at Utah State University as faculty member in administration, as well as within the, the tech college system for a few years. So I'm um, excited to have this conversation today. Thank you, Dave. And then we also, I believe we have on the line, Sid Dixon. Sid Dixon, are you on? I uh, am. Superintendent of, of Utah's public education system. Would you introduce yourself? Good morning, thank you, Pat. It's good to be with people that I so admire on this panel. And uh, I really appreciate the great relationship that we have with higher education and K-12 public ed. I think we are a unique state that has always enjoyed a strong relationship, but it's got even stronger as the Higher Ed Commission has um, formed this new way of being so that we're all thinking and planning and it's more seamless. So as the superintendent of a K-12 system, I really appreciate 
the opportunity that I have in this state to, to be able to collaborate with business and industry and especially our higher ed partners. So thank you for letting me uh, chime in and just be a learner today. Thank you. Thank you. And then we also have Rick and Clifton representing Salt Lake Community College. Uh, Sid, Rick, and, and Clifton are all on, on the call here because we want them to give their two cents worth when it uh, deals with technical education and also public education. Rick and Clifton, would you please introduce yourselves? Un yes. Thank you, Pat. Um, Rick Bully, an Associate Vice President for Workforce and Economic Development at Salt Lake Community College. And uh, we work with uh, both our community members and our industry partners in hopefully getting that match form so that uh, we have the right uh, technically trained individuals for the right open positions. Thank you, Rick. Let's go to Clifton. Um, good morning. I'm Clifton Sanders. I'm Provost for Academic Affairs at Salt Lake Community College. I've been at the, I'm starting year 27 at Salt Lake Community College. Um, and year six in the provost position. Um, with regard to the upcoming merger, you know, Salt Lake Community College is what is known as a comprehensive community college, um, and which means that we are a lot of things to a lot of people. Um, transfer, workforce, education, and so the, the issues with, with our system change, our relation to business and industry, and our relation to community is always at the forefront of our education and engagement agenda. Thank you, Clifton. And I think that will be a, an important perspective for us. Uh, let's move to Harris Simmons first. Harris, what is this new structure? Could you tell us about it? Harris? Uh, you... There we go. Sure, I'd be happy to. The, uh, the new structure is um, the, the, the legislature uh, has uh, created uh, through statute a new uh, uh, Utah Board of Higher Education. And uh, it basically combines the uh, oversight functions that had previously been uh, assigned to both the Board of Regents and the uh, Board of Trustees of the Utah Technical uh, College System. And so uh, those are effectively coming together in this new board. The appointees uh, consist of representatives from both boards and a couple of new members as well. There are 16 uh, members of the new board uh, that are uh, from uh, various walks of life, and then and then two students, so a total of 18. Uh, so I have two student members. That's an increase from uh, the one member that we at least had on the Board of Regents. And uh, uh, we will be overseeing the 16 uh, institutions that combine that that comprise this new. Uh, this new system, and uh, they they are the eight colleges and universities that had been part of the Utah system of higher education, and the eight technical technical colleges that had been part of the uh, UTEC system. And uh, the the intent is uh, for us to provide a much more integrated um, governance structure, but also to, to to really focus on how we can use this to make uh, this a more seamless process for, uh, especially for students, uh, so that uh, uh, students who are trying to figure out what to do next as they're coming out of high school uh, will have, we hope, uh, as we, as we uh, work on some of these issues we'll talk about today, they'll have uh, a, a, a clearer path uh, forward in terms of where do I go if I want to pursue the following kind of career? So that's, that's at a high level what we're trying to accomplish. Okay, thank you, Harris. Uh, great comments. Uh, Dave Wilson, who, what precipitated this change and what expectations do you have as a result of it? As the interim, interim commissioner, will you unmute? There we go. The host had me muted. So, um, yeah, I really appreciated the, the comments from, from Chair Simmons. And I think um, what really precipitated this conversation is, is we've had conversations with legislators. Um, I think legislators wanted to make sure that we had a system in place to take care of the, the massive growth that we're going to see in the state of Utah, both in, in sheer population as well as industry coming into the, to the state. And so, as was Superintendent Dixon mentioned earlier, 
they put together in legislation, the Strategic Planning Commission. And in that commission, um, it was made up of the, our presidents from both um, UTEC as well as the UCI institutions, um, several people from, from industry, as well as other state um, divisions such as DWS, GOED, and so forth. And that the role of that commission was to really look at how can we maximize our benefits of education in the state of Utah, really to benefit the students. And obviously, um, we brought in an outside consultant known as the NCHEMS Group, which is the um, National Center for Higher Education that has been involved in a lot of this work um, for many years. And working with that um, consultant, the commission um, soon realized that even though we were doing some things really well, um, we probably weren't maximizing the um, synergy and the efforts that we could by bringing this system together and really identifying what it is that industry is going to need for the next several years. Um, Chair Simmons mentioned a little bit about pathways. That's probably the thing I'm most excited about of the two systems coming together is to really align the pathways from a technical college into degree um, into degrees at our degree granting institutions to make sure that students have that available to them. There was nothing worse being involved in education for many years is to see a student go to a tech college and then want to pursue their education, but pretty much happen to start over from the very beginning, right? And so I think this is going to allow um, that opportunity to really maximize those efforts. And again, um, the, the commission really looked at what is best for students. And I think as long as we keep that in mind, we're all gonna be headed the right direction. And um, if we're doing what's best for students, obviously then we're gonna be taking care of the needs of industry, right? Because we don't want students in the programs where there's not, and I won't even say job opportunities, I like to say career opportunities for these individuals as they graduate from our programs. Thank you, Commissioner. That was uh, helpful and you touched on students a little bit. Uh, I'd like to probe that a little bit and ask Nina Barnes, what specifically will happen to students and how will this affect the students in our system? Yeah, well, uh, they've mentioned and, and answered a lot of that question and how this governance structure is gonna benefit the students, but the continuity is gonna be really beneficial for all Utah students. Um, it's gonna help us to, or give us an opportunity to look at some policies and the visions and get those aligned as we look at the workforce and the needs that students are gonna to need to be gainfully employed. Um, it's also gonna give us an opportunity to look at maybe currency or credits and the way we look at transfer back and forth within the system. So as students get on this pathway, that these on-ramps and exits and on-ramps work for them because we know that Utah students oftentimes have barriers and challenges where they need to get off or on and their completion may look different. And so it gives them an opportunity to have different levels of completion and be able to exit and still um, enter the workforce and create a profession. And then at whatever time, if they need to on-ramp, that works well. It also gives us an opportunity to change the way we look at post-education for our, our children in Utah. That it's not just a one size fits all, that there are different ways to have completion and to use that in your life to be successful and to contribute to Utah. So I think that's also really powerful. Um, it, it also gives us an opportunity to look at the investment um, of families, of students, of taxpayers, of Utahns in general, and say, how do we invest this better in the student so the outcomes benefit not only the student, but the families and Utahns, and that education is available for all students, and we can do a better job at providing that and enabling them to be better contributors in Utah. Nina, you've really been engaged with students on all of the campuses. I've watched you do that. What are you hearing from them? What are some of the challenges that they're facing that maybe this new governance system could help them with? Do you see some specific benefits from, from this merger? I, I certainly do. And that's the outcome is student success and accessibility, particularly living in rural Utah. Um, the access in and out is critical for our underserved populations. And I see this conversation on currency and credits and transfers as critical to um, continuing to engage students and help them be successful. 
And what I have heard from students is that is the greatest barrier in the Yushi system has been the transfer piece within the system. So it's really an exciting time to do a lot of work there and to utilize that feedback from students and to help remove those barriers. Thank you. Erin Osman, you've been uh, sitting on the tech side of all of this. I'm curious to know what your thoughts are and how this will impact the technical colleges but also businesses. Could you touch on that a little bit as a part of Amazon? That is your world. It is. Yeah. Well, let me, thanks, Pat. Let me start by just articulating some of the unique characteristics of the, the Utah Technology College system. Um, it's, it's known by its students for its, its overall low tuition cost, very low to no student debt, a very high completion rate of programs by those students, and really a compelling ROI for the students in securing immediately high paying, high demand jobs. And then from the employer side, the power of the UTEC system is, it's known for how nimble and quick that it is in responding to local business needs, similar to what Rick and, and, and Clifton were talking about. Business knows they can count on the system to, pro, to put together custom training programs for their current and future employees. And all of that's integrated into this very powerful technical education infrastructure. By bringing these two systems together, though, we do overcome some challenges. For example, UTEC really is one of the best kept secrets in the state. Many families just don't know that this resource of technical education is available and how viable the jobs are that they can secure when completing training in this, in, in this infrastructure. So, we can address that by, by bringing these two systems together under one roof, legitimizing and marketing the power and the value of technical education you know, to Utah students, parents, and families. And we also remove this, really this false perception that the systems compete, that it has to be one option or the other, that you're either a Votech tech ed student or a degree student, and there's no in between. The truth is, as my colleagues have already articulated, we have an opportunity to create a pathway, a true academic pathway to do both, to be able to achieve these industry credentials that drive employability and immediate earning potential, combined with the power of a formal degree for college credit that all the students of Utah can enjoy under one system. That's the real power of this combination. Thank you. I think that was really well said, a very articulate, I wanted to jump to a different question that I'd like to hear from all of you, but also from um, from higher educate from higher education and public education from Sid Dixon and Clifton and and uh, the others that are on the line. Uh, here's the question that I would like to ask you: uh, There are many industries, and education is no exception to that, that are really going through some difficult times with COVID. But I'm wondering if we could look at this a little different way as a possible reset perhaps as an opportunity to rethink how to educate and what to teach our kids going forward. Can we look at this as kind of a reset and an opportunity? And if so, how? Erin, it looks like you're shaking your head yes. Uh, I'd like to hear from each one of you, but uh, if you could go first, let's hear from you. You would unmute. I would say that this, this situation that we're facing right now um, uh, is fundamentally changing the way that we look at education. And, um, you know, even though it's created stresses and pressures on the education system that were unprecedented, it's creating an opportunity for us to rethink the way that we approach education, both from a standpoint of the leverage of technology, the use of technology and the delivery of training, but also I would say in the, in the types of things that we need to focus on, what are the true value points in our education system that will bring the greatest employability opportunity for the students that attend our higher education system. So I, I think there's tremendous, it's a catalyst in my view, a catalyst for change and we have a very unique opportunity to, uh, to capture that into this new board. Could you elaborate on that just based on now that we have you on? Would yeah. you would you just tell us a little bit more about what that means in terms of what the, the needs are out there that you think we can fulfill now that we couldn't before? Well, I think when you look at the unique situation created by COVID, for example, around current unemployment, 
you have enormous numbers of people, millions of people across the country, for example, that are currently unemployed or looking for reskilling or finding a more resilient uh, employment opportunity than they've had in the past. Because we're bringing these two systems together, we have an opportunity to really focus on what are the actual job opportunities that will create the most resilient opportunity for Utah uh, citizens. And to tie the educational opportunities with those employment opportunities more purposefully, unifying our efforts as a system to do that. And then from a technology perspective, figuring out what is really critical to deliver in person through hands-on experiential types of training versus things that can be done effectively, cost-effectively and efficiently from a delivery perspective, utilizing technology that we're now kind of being forced to use. But leveraging that, improving the experiencing, the experience for the students and taking that technological training delivery experience to the next level and making it more cost-effective and efficient for us and for the students. Those are the two examples I would give. Sid Dixon, could you give us a, a public education perspective on this? What does it mean to public education and how that dovetails into higher education? Yeah, thank you. I really appreciate what Erin just articulated and love that you're talking about a reset. We've been talking about the three phases of um, trying to, to navigate our way through COVID-19 and, and as we think about what we're calling our third phase or the, the new future, we talk about not just recovery, but reimagining. So we're right there with you. And we have launched Portrait of a Graduate as our way of thinking about this, that we are looking at a Utah map that connects directly to higher education. So thinking about mastery of not only academics, but skill sets as well. And autonomy is the A in map. How do we engage students in thinking about personal responsibility and collective responsibility and creative thinking and problem solving and the skill set that we often hear from industry that is so needed. And then the P stands for purpose. If our students feel that they have a purpose in life, uh, that's, that's um, emotional and social well-being and thinking about um, civic engagement and all of those things that make for a well-rounded employee and citizen. So taking a holistic approach and getting away from what I call the three B's that have driven our system for far too long in the K-12 space, and that's bells, uh, buses, and butt time or seat time, and really moving into this space of competency. So I looked at the list of participants that are on this call, and these are colleagues that we work with in a variety of sectors, whether it's through Talent Ready Utah or higher education or the former UTech I think we have a common understanding that we need to engage our systems differently, that it's not um, bound by Carnegie units, but what is it that our, that will move our um, culture and our industry forward in a more convergent manner. So we've been pretty good at collaborating up to this point, but what does convergence look like? Really carrying one another's water and having a seamless approach to making sure that our students, whether they're in K-12 or higher ed, can be nimble and be ready to flex as we not only adapt to a new way of being, but create a new way of being as well. We should be creator, creators and leaders, not just responders and learners. So it's a different way of thinking about how we provide education to our students in a more nimble way. Thank you, Superintendent. That is a great perspective too. I'd like to hear from Commissioner Wilson Hume on this, uh, just this reset idea. You know, what do you foresee? Uh, and, and this sounds like a very integrated program uh, and system, uh, that, which is uh, something that I think both, all of our systems have been trying to work on, but we have an opportunity now. How do you see it? Yeah, thanks Regent Jones. Obviously it's not, um, should we take the opportunity? We must take the opportunity, right? Um, during this time to, to reset and really think about how we're delivering our education. Um, in the middle of March, I mean, it was amazing to sit back and watch our institutions and faculty, faculty that thought there was no other way to teaching than a face-to-face -face classroom. Um, faculty members that have had done it for years and years and years, right? It almost become a, a tradition of how they taught their classes. But to get those faculty members to 
quickly within a week's time to move those courses to an online format and not to lose the integrity of the class and keep the, the learning at a very high level. You hear several of those faculty members tell me personally and tell the presidents who then tell me that, wow, this, was, this is actually kind of a cool mode of delivery for these students and the students are performing at a very high level to where in the past there was, there was just no way that they could do it in their minds, right? So to be able to do that, to be able to have that transition, I think going forward, we're gonna see a modality of education is going to change. Um, now, I'm not saying that the face-to-face, -face, the personal interaction on our campuses are going to go away, but I think what we will see is our students become more and more engaged in hybrid type classes to where the students go out and do a lot of the reading and the, the work on their own and then come back into the classroom and have a real collaborative discussion or, and, um, and conversation around now how do we apply it, right? How do we engage in what we've learned in industry and to make sure that we're ready for the workforce and to prepare to, to do that. And I think the biggest thing for me is that will allow our students to get completed at a much quicker pace than they maybe they have in the past. Um, if they can pick up a couple of online classes or they can work around their schedules a little bit more, I think we're gonna see our students um, go to from 12 credits to 15 credits, maybe to 18 credits a semester to get through that pipeline quicker, which one of the key, key um, things that we're working on within the system is completion. And, and you look at the things that um, our institutions have done. President Watkins has been the champion around completion and it's kind of led off into our other institutions as well of being able to get students completed to do that. So that's one area. The other area I think is going to, to make a major difference, which we're already seeing is, um, we know we're gonna have to provide some training to um, industry, uh, to our students to be able to provide the needs of industry, which um, Vice um, Chair Osmond mentioned, to be able to retool these individuals who are unemployed or maybe furloughed to be able to do that. But sometimes in the past, we've always looked at our technical colleges to do that, which they do a wonderful job of, of doing that. And we have three institutions within our, um, within the UCI system with USU Eastern and Salt Lake Community College and Snow that have that same role. And so all 11 of them have done a wonderful job of doing that. What we're realizing, it may take um, all of us, all 16 institutions to do that. So we're having our, even our research one institutions look at how do we take micro credentials of a master's degree? and do some short-term training that would help those individuals that are furloughed to be able to be a better asset to maybe the, even the industry that they're going back to or the organization they're going back to. So it's really has started to, to energize and to get our institutions to really start thinking creatively of what's gonna be the best benefit to students and to industry. Commissioner, while we have you on, would you give us all a quick update on what to expect this fall if you do know at the present time? Yeah, so our institutions have, and, and I applaud each and every one of them, all 16 institutions, we've been working, um, even though we're not one yet with the tech colleges as well, to really develop plans um, that will be um, published here at the end of this month. Um, we, we published our statewide plan a couple of, of um, weeks ago. Now each of the institutions will be publishing in their individualized plan. Each institution is going to look a little bit different as we go back to, to school fall semester because they all have unique needs. But one of the things that, um, that we're going to make sure is at the number one on the list is the safety of our students and our faculty and staff. So our institutions are doing everything possible to put those safety protocols into place, working with the state health department, local health department, CDC guidelines, um, really collaborative working together to identify what that might look like. We know that our institutions are not going to look the same as they would on a year ago fall, right? Or hopefully a year from now, um, hopefully it'll look much different going back to school than it's going to, to look this, this fall. Um, and some of the safety precautions they're putting in is to make sure that we have testing and contact tracing in place. And that's one of the things we're working on right now at the state and local health department and with the University of Utah to identify what that's going to look like. How are we gonna test? Is it we, are we testing everybody or are we only testing those with, um, with symptoms? Um, and what does that mean with individuals that may be asymptomatic coming to our campuses? What are we going to do when there's a breakout in the dorms? Um, we're, we're keeping some dorms open at each of the institutions to be able to isolate those individuals. Some institutions are requiring masks. Others are, are asking students to to do it on their, own, on their own honor. So each of the institutions will be sending out to the students that enrolled their institutions all these guidelines and protocols 
And obviously you can go to their web pages at each of the institutions. They're updating those websites daily of what students can expect going back to fall semester. We're confident, but, but things change. It's fluid. I mean, we'll be, we'll be making changes to these plans probably clear up through spring semester, to be honest with you, until we have a vaccine um, door, we can all get back to normal. So again, I applaud our institutions. It's a heavy, heavy load for them, but they're doing it for the betterment of the students and for their faculty and staff. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, I want to remind the audience to send in your questions on the chat function. Uh, I, I wanted to go to Chair Simmons now and, and ask you, uh, Chair Simmons, what your thoughts are as, as a person in business. Uh, what do you see? Uh, do you see this as a reset? Uh, how do you think this will change industry and business uh, in your world? Well, I think that uh, uh, first, just a thought about kind of this this idea of reset. I I do think that that the pandemic we're going through is going to have uh, a lot of implications for how all of us are doing business um, for for years to come. It's a, it's going to accelerate some trends. Uh, the the idea of a video conference call isn't totally new, but the technology that we're all using, as we're seeing on this webinar, uh, has become pretty pervasive uh, for most of us here over the last three months. And uh, I think that has a lot of implications, certainly in higher education, as well as in all of our businesses. That said, I think that at the end of the day, uh, students are going to drive, uh, as the consumers of higher education, are really going to uh, ultimately determine uh, how we serve them. And there are a lot of things that are done that we do in higher education that can't readily be done uh, via a, a Zoom conference call. Uh, a lot of the lab work, um, a lot of the uh, just ex experience, uh, experiential kind of aspects of, of what you, uh, what you, uh, uh, experience as a student on a college campus. Uh, we want students to have those experiences for those who want them. And, and, and so I, there, there are going to be different uh, uh, needs, I think, for different kinds of students, uh, depending on where they are and their, you know, what their, where their aspirations are, what their uh, financial uh, situation looks like, uh, what kind of jobs they're looking to go into. But, but uh, we're all going to become much more facile at using uh, technology. And, uh, and, you know, and I, I should note, I think even outside of our system of higher education, we have here in Utah with Western Governors University, with uh, the BYU Pathway uh, a program, uh, uh, Utah actually is, 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 is a center for uh, distance learning. And uh, we have a lot to learn from each other and a lot to, uh, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of opportunity to um, make it more affordable and more convenient for students to access higher education uh, in the years ahead. For business, um, what we hope to accomplish is um, to produce, produce the kind of workforce that, uh, that Utah businesses need. And Could you I see that, I mean, see that as... Chair Simmons, would you explain that from your perspective? What is it that businesses need right now? Yeah, well, I, listen, we can't, um, no, I always begin with a notion that you, we can't force students to, you know, we, you know, we, we, we don't uh, really take students and slot them into a track and say, this is what businesses are gonna need. But the marketplace is a marvelous thing at kind of working through this as, as students see what kind of opportunities were, you know, where, where the good jobs are, where they can make money. And, uh, uh, you know, and we're certainly seeing in Utah a demand, a, 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 a huge demand for, uh, for technology talent. Um, in my business, we see it uh, every day uh, uh, as we, as we uh, uh, try to attract uh, uh, really good technology talent, cybersecurity. Um, th th those, those are a couple of, you know, that come readily to mind, engineers. Uh, so STEM education, uh, science, technology, engineering, math have all become much more important to industry in, uh, in recent years. At the same time, one of the things that I always, I, I, 
I always want to uh, remind myself and I hope others that part of what we want to accomplish is to create whole human beings. Uh, this isn't just, we're not producing kind of widgets uh, to go do engineering. Uh, uh, I'm a banker and I spend a lot of my time thinking about financial things. Uh, but a lot of the um, fullness and abundance that I find in life comes from reading Robert Frost's poetry or uh, listening to good music or, I mean, there are a lot of, there are a lot of elements to life that we can help uh, provide a foundation for students uh, that will be outside of their careers, uh, extracurricular to them, uh, that ought to also be part of this experience. And uh, we should never lose sight of that because um, on our campuses, we, we find a lot of things going on that don't lead directly to jobs and that's okay. It's actually great uh, because it's, it's creating uh, whole human beings and I think that's really an important goal of uh, what our system needs to be focused on. Well said, many people agree with that. I wanted to go to Vice Chair uh, Nina Barnes now, and, and maybe this is something you'd like to touch on too, uh, Nina, what uh, Chair Simmons just said, uh, as, as Vice Chair of the Board of Regents, what have you seen in developing the whole student, and has that been an important priority for the Board of Regents, and will it continue to be with the new board? Unmute. Okay, well, while we're in the lag, let, let me go to Rick and to Clifton. Oh, oh go ahead, Nina, go ahead. Oh, I, I'm sorry. Okay, let's hear from you. I, I thought I was unmuted. Anyway, well said, well said Harris, and, and obviously that is a primary goal of the board and has been of the Board of Regents, is the development of the whole citizen and contributor to Utah. And so um, obviously we've been really successful when you see the success of our state. I did wanna go back to the COVID piece as, as they were talking about students, and, and that's been a focus of mine, just when we try to look at the opportunities for this educational disruptor we've just experienced. And I love what Superintendent Dixon said about let's reimagine. I mean, it's just such a brilliant opportunity for us to come together and reimagine what we can do. And also with the merging of these two systems, what an incredible opportunity. And even beyond, as Superintendent Dixon suggested, with the K through 12 groups, groups, because we are responsible for all of Utah's children, regardless of age. It's the same source of funding for all of our children. And so to make this seamless is really critical. But as we talk about the COVID and how this has been a disruptor, I really uh, particularly think it's an opportunity as we talked about barriers or transfer for students. What are the barriers that students um, come across and that this opportunity to have more online or more hybrid will be particularly meaningful for students that are disadvantaged or rural or don't have the access and the opportunity to go live a traditional um, college life and that this delivery will enable them to be much more successful at all levels. I think it's also could possibly help remove the barrier where we see with retention, where we lose so many of our students, particularly with the mental illness and anxiety crisis we're in, that it gives them an opportunity to be educated and to excel, maybe in different environments that are safer and more conducive to their success. So I really think it's an opportunity to look and deliver and have more successes with certain populations with maybe um, different barriers. You know, I would like to go to uh, Aaron Osman, but I, ha I have a question from the audience I'd like to throw in because I think it's so relevant right now. Uh, and it comes from Brittany Dane. When we treat students as consumers, it influences their classroom vulnerability and ultimately how they learn. Rather than treating them as consumers, how can higher education partner with students and encourage them to become active producers rather than passive consumers? Uh, Aaron, do you, you wanna grab that? What else you wanted to say? Well, I, I will defer that to uh, Commissioner Wollstenhume. I think that uh, he can provide some really good perspective on that. I did want to just respond on two points First, as we talk about um, 
you know, the importance of education. I really appreciate what Harris said about the, the, the full human being development. And in this new combined system, the key is that we don't have to choose one or the other, that we can enable students to have a full education, be a, a completely balanced human being and prepare them to provide for their families in good high paying jobs. And I think that really is the critical the opportunity that we have here is we can do both. It shouldn't be an either or. And I, I also want to talk about the, the from the business community perspective, one of the challenges that we've had ongoing, both in public education and higher education, is educating students about what the economic opportunities actually are in their local market, helping them understand what jobs are there and what they pay and what the opportunities are so they can make active, proactive decisions about what to pursue. I think we can do a much better job in this new combined system in partnering with industry to share to students as early as high school or middle school about high paying opportunities that are available in the marketplace, show them the pathways to get there and their complete education at the same time. And so Aaron, with that, you're in that world. Yeah. Uh, you know, if someone's listening right now, wondering how, how does that happen and what resources do we have? Could you quickly let us know that? Sure. I think that it's a, it's a partnership with our um, counselors in the education system, empowering them with relevant recent market data, showing the open jobs, the number of open jobs and what they pay and giving more contextual information about the specific companies and what they do in the products and services they provide through our counselor infrastructure, both in K-12 and higher ed. And those are also helped by uh, organizations now like Success in Education. Exactly. Uh, where they are publishing that kind of data. Thank you. Let's go back to Commissioner Wilson Hume. You wanted to talk about the whole student, the whole child. Yeah, I, I really appreciated um, Chair Simmons's comments on that and, and Brittany's question. Um, it's, it's, it's so apparent um, as I've been a faculty member for many years and teaching in the classroom, when we get our students involved, um, we actually learn more from them than I think they learn from us as faculty members. But it takes that engagement, it takes the involvement. It's not a lecture in front of the students, but it's getting them involved and engaged and part of the learning environment where we all learn, we all work through things together. And that's one of the things I think our campuses do a, 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 just a really good job on is to get the students connected and the different clubs, different organizations, different things that are going on on campus to where they can serve, they can give back, they can be part of the community which they reside. And that becomes really powerful. I've had two students of my own, um, children of my own, has gone through that. The most, the, probably the thing that they, I think that they've taken away from their education experience the most are those types of environments. Sure, they learn great things in the classroom. They learn great things for their instructors. And, and I think that's really powerful. But what I hope they've learned how to do is to communicate. I hope they've learned to, to work well with others. I hope they've learned to, to, when they go into a business or in an industry, they're a contributor in that way not just within their book smarts, but also within that, those things that I just uh, talked and discussed. So they are much more than a consumer. They have to be part of the whole. They have to be part of the decision-making process. They have to be part of everything that we do at an institution. Because again, what are we there for? We're there for our students. And they're not just a widget. They're not just a, 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 a consumer. They're a partner in what it is that we're trying to accomplish. So Brittany, thanks for that question because regardless of whether it's in technical education or students working on a PhD, as soon as we lose that aspect, I think we're failing at education. That's a great segue into the next question uh, by one of our attendees. And that is, how can we more effectively engage parents in the college and career pathway process in those earlier years? What can be done there? I know there are some things. Would someone like to jump in? I'll start, uh, I'd be happy to. Uh, first of all, I, I, I really wish we could, uh, as a society, focus on how we get parents thinking about this uh, from the moment their child is born. I mean, I think a lot of the foundation for, for success academically, uh, uh, it begins before uh, a child ever sets foot in, uh, in kindergarten. Um, uh, children who are, uh, you know, who have parents that actually engage with them, that are reading to them, teaching them how to read, 
uh, how to write. Um, even before they start into the public school system, this isn't, we should never think of this as being, as parents, we should never think of this as being uh, the state's obligation to educate our kids. Uh, that, that, that should be a parental obligation. And the state is there as a, as a, as a really strong partner. But if we start there, uh, the, the, the downstream impact of that is huge. And uh, I, uh, as I've said in some other forums before, um, uh, because I tend to think, of, uh, I, by virtue of my background, I think of this in terms of compound interest. <laughs> and, and things that when you start compounding early, uh, you take you make those changes early on and 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 the impact years later is much greater than if you're tackling it you know when they're seniors in high school so it's setting expectations uh, I think uh, I think one of the most important things parents can do is to set high expectations of their kids um, to have them know that uh, we expect you to excel that doesn't necessarily mean we expect you to go, you know, to go to graduate school or get a PhD. That may be coming an excellent plumber or an excellent welder, uh, uh, you know, uh, but whatever you do, uh, we expect you to do it well and to become a whole human being. And I think, I think if parents can embrace that kind of attitude, it makes a big difference uh, in my experience um, with how, with, with, how kids succeed in, uh, in both public and higher education. I, I'd like to hear from, uh, let's see, Sid, Rick, and Clifton on, uh, if you know, how could parents access resources? You know, I, I think everyone would agree we need to start early. And as Harris mentioned, you know, when a child is born, parents need to be engaged. But many parents don't know where to go or how to access information or what the new information is. Anyone want to jump in? I'd love to. I think that's one of the things we've learned in this space of remote learning. Uh, we have underestimated the importance of communicating with our parents. And, and we've always used the verbiage that parents are key partners in education, that triangulation of the student, the school, and the parent or the home. Uh, I think we've underestimated the importance of communicating with them. So we expose our students to a lot of information. I think fairly early on, starting primarily in junior high with opportunities, um, but I don't think we've emphasized the things that Harris and others have talked about when um, we talk about how to teach kids to be responsible, how to teach them how to be curious learners, uh, autonomous learners, um, how to be flexible, how to be creative. So those are those are things that we need support in, in the home and in the school. Now, we have this great resource on our Utah Education Telehealth Network uh, website. There are a lot of resources for parents in how they, how they can teach these things in the home and resources for them. Uh, but let's talk about populations where uh, families may not have access to broadband. To me, that is a great, um, a great principle of equity. And I think we've got to start thinking about access to um, broadband in a way that is like a utility. It's just like paying your electric bill. If we continue with this digital divide, then our most marginalized populations uh, will continue to not have access to information. So a lot of what we do in putting out information comes in a digital form. And we need to think about it in multiple languages and using our community partners so that fam families who come from refugee status, families who may not speak English, families who um, may not have ac access to our higher education system as well, really understand the possibilities and opportunities for every student in our state. So um, I think we just have to be more strategic as a system and thinking about every family and every student. The information is there, but it's, as uh, Mr. Simmons mentioned, it starts young in how we help our students become autonomous learners and become responsible uh, citizens. And it's, it's not just about the academics, but it's all of it together. Superintendent Dixon, there has been a, a follow-up question to this. If those resources are prepared and available in multiple languages, you hit on that a little bit. Are they available? Well, we have things that could quickly be translated. I think it's about uh, funding to make that happen and opportunities. And so we need to reach out to community resources like our refugee centers, um, libraries, churches, places where we might have 
um, our citizens congregate who maybe don't speak English, but but they go to these various places to access information. And right now, I think we use very traditional means. We use our school counselors. Um, we have from the higher ed, uh, a, a new initiative with higher ed counselors in our schools, advisors rather, who help our students. So we're trying some different opportunities that are targeted at students. I just don't think we've been strategic enough at working with our parents. The app that we have is great. Utah Futures is great that um, our parents have been able to access but sometimes we fit that into a box of a, a middle class or educated um, family, right? So we have to think about that more broadly. Rick and Clifton, do you have any comments on how technical colleges are preparing students to meet the demands of our business communities? Uh, any comments from you? Pat, uh, this is Rick. I'll, I'd like to, to expound on Superintendent Dixon's comments about how we reach out. Um, I think some of the most rewarding conversations I've ever had when we were reaching out to high school age students was the, the after conversation that I had with the parents that were looking for better opportunities. And so anytime that we've had the opportunity to work with our adult learners and get them in the system so that they have a better career opportunity, that's an, an incredible modeling that goes on in that household. So all of a sudden that young person that we intended to talk to initially sees that their parents are interested in getting into a better career situation. And so you, you really have a lasting effect on the entire family structure if you can get to that adult learner as well. Because we know that not everyone in our communities uh, get the same opportunities and the same access. And obviously that's one of our goals is to have that access. And, and maybe that transitions into that, uh, the question that you asked, how are, we, how are we working with our communities on the technical college side? And, and I think um, we have to look at all of our community members and go out to the community and, and let them know what, these, what those opportunities are. During this time of this pandemic over the last few months, we've had several companies actually still growing aggressively during this time. And so we've pivoted to help those companies and align some of the individuals and some of the community groups that I've just talked about to align them with those career opportunities. And of course, that necessitated a different type of training. But at the same time, we're in a paradigm shift situation with higher ed. And I think what we do six months from now will definitely be different than what we did six months ago. But Every member of our community deserves this opportunity and it's incumbent upon us to get out there and, and, and reach out to them. And, and I know our friends uh, with uh, the UTEC system that will come under USBE, we are, we're excited that uh, we can provide that and continue to provide that. And, and from the industry standpoint, as long as we're listening to industry to find out what those needs are, rather than going out and saying, we're higher ed and we're here to help, no, we're higher ed and we're here to serve. If we align the community and align with industry needs, then we, you know, we're in the most diverse economy in the country. So uh, I, we have some wonderful opportunities, some wonderful challenges, and uh, we'll see if we can't marry those up. There's time for one more question. Uh, uh, how can we engage our refugee and other language parents to help them better understand the opportunities for themselves and their children. Quickly answer that one because I do have a final question I'd like to ask. Anyone? Um, I can jump in. Um, you know, I, I, first of all, I want to, this is Clifton. I want to um, to heartily give an amen to Sid's and Rick's comments. Um, Salt Lake Community College, for example, with regard to this question, we we have an ongoing relationship with. Um, Depart Department of Workforce Services, the Division of Refugee Services, and we and we've developed um, a working relationship where, you know, where through those organizations we try to do outreach, we try to do training, and engage parents and communities where you know where they are. And um, one thing that I haven't heard as loudly in this conversation is that higher, higher ed, and Sid touched on it with public ed, we need to develop the ability to listen better. 
because yes, we're talking about individual um, students and children, but what we're really talking about, whether it be economic or social or cultural, is strengthening communities so that we all can be better together. You know, COVID-19 has exposed some huge socioeconomic and access divides. And so now it's time to mobilize technology and revision education to be able to listen to like first generation communities and students and, and be there through the things that we do, whether it be through P20 Alliance, whether it be through business and industry partnerships. The idea is to listen to families, you know, on their own terms and making sure that, that people's voices are being heard rather than bodies being processed. I, I speak this, I'm a first generation um, college student who eventually got their PhD. And so I'm particularly attuned to the need to be able to respect parents who have aspirations for their kids beyond what they could dream and to be able to really help as partners um, strengthen communities. Thank you, Clifton. Well said. We appreciate you. Uh, I do have one final comment. We just have a couple of minutes left. I want to know what the priorities for the board are. What would you say are the top one or two priorities for the new Board of Higher Education? Harris, do you want to jump first? Yeah, I, 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 sure. I'll, uh, I'll, I'll mention a couple and then uh, other, others can jump in. I, I, I'd start with uh, one of the really most important things we do is we select the uh, presidents of the institutions that we oversee. And that is a critically important thing because the, the real, a lot of the real leadership uh, happens on our campuses. And we have some great leaders uh, in both systems that are coming together here. Um, we'll obviously be de you know, dealing this year with uh, uh, how we safely bring students back on the campus. Um, we'll be dealing with a lot of issues in terms of putting these two systems together. Um, we'll be dealing with uh, the state budget impacts that are so uh, dramatically being affected by, uh, by this uh, coronavirus uh, crisis. Um, I, I, I expect that we're going to be working on a lot of uh, and sorting through kind of priorities we'd had at the Board of Regents and priorities uh, that uh, over in the UTEC system that they'd had and figuring out how we, how we merge those and make sure that we're tackling uh, priorities on all of our campuses um, in ways that are appropriate to those campuses. And finally, in my, uh, 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 something I feel is a, is a great opportunity is by putting these two systems together, we think that there are a lot of efficiencies that we can find for taxpayers uh, that don't really affect the academic mission, but that will allow us to more effectively uh, share some back office kinds of services and functions and, uh, and do this better and uh, more affordably uh, as a state. So I, that's, that's an, an important objective of mine. Uh, others might, uh, want to chime in with anything else. 30 seconds, Aaron. Spot on, Harris. I have nothing to add. What about you, Nina, as vice chair? Yeah, that, that was great. I did, just what an opportunity is for us in this new governance to just come together. We have all the resources at the table and to be able to set those sort of priorities and create a system that will move Utah um, forward we serve like enhance and elevate all of the students all of our children in Utah to give them a place to develop and grow and be educated to live productive lives and to contribute to the Utah life I think that's really powerful and that's ultimately the goal that we're all working towards thank you uh, commissioner you have one uh, about 10 seconds <laughs> Yeah, thanks everybody. Um, you know, it's a great opportunity. Let's take advantage of it and um, make education powerful in the state of Utah. Thank you. I want to thank the panelists. They are tremendous individuals as well as talented people in their own professions. Uh, I want to thank them. Uh, thank you for listening and we'll have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, Pat.